Welcome back to the Future of Photography. I'm Chris, and uh, there's Imar, Adrian, and Jeremiah. I even pointed in the right direction <laughs> in the video. Whoops. <laughs> Backwards. That's good. That's very clever. I'm impressed by that, actually. Uh, very good. I, I practiced I couldn't there do it. for hours. Okay. Um, if you don't watch, if you're not watching the video, you're missing out. Um, let me see. Oh, we have so, a, a, a a bit of feedback. The first one is from Ben, who on the video, who wrote, finally managing to watch rather than listen. Hey, Ben, how are you doing? And mm. uh, the other one is by Jürgen, and he writes, I was at the Trevi Fountain before 8 a.m. and there was nobody. Ah. So I took the tourist-free picture. Problem was mm -hmm. that there was no fountain <laughs> as the maintenance workers stopped the water, most likely to get the coins out. You cannot have everything. <laughs> oh, well. So it is. It is notoriously difficult to get a good picture of the Trevi. Could fountain. always digitally <laughs> add the water afterwards. <laughs> there you, you go. So, so you want uh, the water running and no people. Yeah, mm. ideally. Okay. Um, anyway, let's see. We have a bunch of series that we kind of follow in parallel here, and we are just we're just kicking off a new one today, and that is. Um, about our personal stories regarding photography. Um, the title is Photos That Changed My FOP, My Future of Photography. So um, I, I'm not sure. I, th I don't think we have a clear definition of what that format is going to be for this type mm -hmm. of an episode. But um, we thought um, uh, we, 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 we decided... Stories. We decided Imar is our guinea pig uh, <laughs> to try this out. So, um, <laughs> Actually, it was I. It was I, but you missed that episode. Oh, we Remember did already. I, I, oh. I did Irving Penn. You Whoa, did. that oh. was. Okie dokie. All right. So um, it's an episode that I missed, but <laughs> let's, let's try this one again. Maybe it's because we have two big gaps, uh, bigger, bigger, bigger gaps between these different uh, segments. This one is Imar's episode. So Imar, what photo changed your future of photography? Okay, so it, not just one photo, because um, I have to say, I had to kind of go back and think about this a bit. How did I get into photography? Like, while I was in secondary school, which is, I suppose, high school, um, I, I studied art and art has always been, I've said this before, art's my first love always. So I always seen photography in the context of, of the art, you know, so um, I didn't have anybody around me who was into photography or like I just wasn't aware my my Nana had like a box brownie in her wardrobe and I knew that was there, but I knew it didn't work. And I, I was fascinated by it as an object, but like I had no sense of photography outside of, I suppose, the family outings, photographs, special occasions, that type of thing. So um, even in secondary school, I loved art history. I love art history still. I still fantasize that someday I'll go back to college and study art history properly. So I've said that now and it's on film, so I have to do it. Um, <laughs> it's out in the public. <laughs> yeah, but even when studying art history for exams and stuff, there was, I was thinking about my art book because I still have it from, from school. I couldn't part with it. I loved it so much. <laughs> and uh, it's there and it's fallen to bits, but there's no photographers in it. There's just there's nothing about really? photography uh, yeah as a medium it was very much like kind of covered everything from the syllabus i suppose as it was covered everything from prehistoric like the, the bronze age up onto um the 20th century but only maybe abstract expressionism kind of the 40s 50s uh, that was as new as the art was in that book so really when i left school and i went to this portfolio preparation course for art college, which is a year of like just getting your portfolio ready. And that was my very, very first introduction to photography at all as uh, anything other than, you know, a picture in a newspaper, like journalistic photo or, or a family picture. And the first person that jumped out at me in the context of the photography was Diane Arbus. And I still, to this day, really recall a lot of those images and as I was looking back over different I've only ever seen one in reality uh, at a show in the Butler Gallery in Kilkenny a few years ago and it was the young man putting on his makeup 
uh, which is a he's version, um, yeah. a drag queen, I think, and she's yeah. a really young face. But that really stuck with me. But that wasn't the one. It was the child with the hand grenade. If anybody knows that one, mm -hmm. it's a little boy. That one. The, that yeah, one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, he really yeah, stuck with me. And also, I just I don't know what it was. I I just had never seen. Well, I think her, her observational skills, for starters, and the fact that she was sort of on the edge of society and in the underbelly and, um, yeah, there he is. <laughs> what a great kid. Look at his skinny little legs. <laughs> but she seemed to have this way to capture like a moment like these ones in the park or then the kind of intimacy of people in their houses like there's one of the giant like a, it's called a jewish giant with his parents or something and it's just their living room and they're so kind of 50s and 60s looking as well um i don't know what they did to me but i've really they stuck with me those images really stuck with me and i love the quality of i love the contrast in her the black and white. So at, that would have been my very first experience of having a black and white camera. So like if you see what I do now, it's you'd say, oh, my God, how has this got anything to do with anything like, you know, but they really opened up my mind or something. I don't know at the time. Uh, I just look, they're excellent. They just there's a real. You could sort of linger on them for a long time and try and figure out the story. So I suppose they have a kind of a real journalistic thing about them as well, that they, they tell a bit of a story, they intrigue and everything. So that was the first person to kind of blow my mind. And then I'll second, I... I'll second that. I have, <laughs> yeah. to, I have to give a big cheer to, to yeah. Diane Arbus because yeah. she also was one of those major inspiring um photographers who came out of commercial photography okay I didn't know that either. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she understood the difference between sort of slick imagery etc mm. etc commercial uh, uh kind of image making and that kind of neo-journalistic but mm. artistic um observational skills that really broke a lot of mold maybe yeah 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 so i loved her stuff then i went to, into the art college proper and decided that well i always kind of wanted to do sculpture and that was what i had in my head but in my mind sculpture had quite a traditional sort of um uh you know themes to it and uh the physical making of something and you know that was I was very much into that. But when I got to art college in the 90s, I kind of discovered that we were in a bit of a different time and all of a sudden nobody was really doing that kind of work anymore and that we were going into this kind of postmodernist phase. And I used to I hate that phrase. I just couldn't stand it. And I railed against it and I hated everything about it. And I almost disliked things on purpose. I wouldn't even give them a chance. But and I was young. then. <laughs> now I love that type of work. But at the time, I just probably wasn't equipped to it's not what I had in my head. My expectations weren't being met and I just wasn't happy. So I kind of had to rethink what I was going to do. What, what I did notice was that loads of people were doing sort of performative type work. And I think that it was looking at photographs of all this sort of performance that was going on that um, kind of allowed me to think, OK, maybe I can use this because performance art to me, at, especially at that age, was definitely for people who had confidence, um, were very self assured. I was none of those things. So how do you negotiate that? Well, the camera became kind of like an intermediary there in that you didn't have to do anything live, but you could sort of make work that that sort of was fitting the brief without, you know, putting too much pressure on yourself. And then I got into the whole um, concept of kind of the, that land art type stuff and that kind of ephemeral making things, leaving them, going back to them, taking photos of them after a week, see what had happened. And, and they're like photography is really your only way to capture any of that. So I kind of I glided into it on a sort of not as a photographer, but um, like if you were to ask me a technical question, forget about it, really, you know, which is probably horrifying to all of you. But no, there you go. Um, so then after that, I, I ended up kind of carried it on for a while and I, I 
found that when once I left college and I didn't have the access to a dark room and all that that entails, that I kind of I found it much more difficult to take photos because we're kind of pre digital still here. Now, digital cameras did exist, but they probably weren't very good. Not the ones I could afford on my budget. And um, it just it didn't become a thing. So color photography, I did a bit of, um, but had no means to process them. So you're sending them off to somebody else to process and you just get your images back. So that was OK. I made some nice things. I made lovely light boxes once with um, these things called Juratran prints, which probably don't even I don't know. They're probably very they were at the height of kind of technology then at the time when I made them. They cost me an arm and a leg, but they looked gorgeous. And I had these frames uh, kind of specially commissioned by the guy that I ended up working for who um, they were beautiful actually they were lovely they were specially designed for for the prints and they weren't light boxes they were more panels and actually still have them they're lovely i'd love to see them again but um yeah i i just drifted away from it then and ended up sort of going into the framing and just it was more a case of looking at other people's work and framing other people's work and like looking at the composition uh well, all kinds of work painting photography as well but um just the kind of, I suppose, that stuck with me then as a kind of a, you know, the composition of something, the way it's framed. I um, I cannot stand like a wonky horizon line. It just drives me bonkers. Uh, and I, I kind of fell away from it for ages and ages and ages. I got married. I had babies. I had a job. I didn't have time to take photos. I was too busy framing other people's stuff. And then enter the iPhone which I I know I'm going about all the time, but there you go. It brought me back to taking any kind of photos because um, once the kids came along, really all the only photos that I ever took was like portraits of them or, you know, I would get it into my head one day. OK, I'm going to take some photos. What what can I do? And all I really had was a two year old. So, OK, you're my subject and uh, took some nice photos, but never had any urge to um, do that commercially at all whatsoever in any way shape or form so uh when the iphone came along it kind of and and actually when i when i took my first set of pictures with the iphone the first day i got it i think i was just probably out for a walk with um a very small child in tow and the first photo i posted on instagram which isn't there anymore because it was a completely different account was um uh, some rubbish uh like on the ground like a some newspaper, crumpled up newspaper and some poppies. I must see if I can find it. And if I can, because I think it's probably on Flickr because I save everything into Flickr. So I think that that whole Instagram account is living in there somewhere way at the very way back in the recesses of history somewhere. But um, and I saw that you could kind of put these filters on it or that you could sharpen it a little bit or change the contrast. And that just blew me away. And after that, then I was off, but I probably haven't challenged myself enough um, <laughs> in real photography for an awfully long time. But um, sounds like you're doing real okay photography. Too. Yeah, that's just, what I, was with, just you know, I try to do something every day, but I suppose there's no, um, you know, we, we've been having this conversation <laughs> about um, what the chicken and the egg. So do you find the thing to photograph or do you just take? Are you photographing an object for just the sake of it, or are you just taking the photograph? And then I don't know, but I think people like these, like people like Diane Arbus, I think observation, you know, um, make to make somebody that can make you look at the world differently, or just make you notice the world, um, or the minutiae of things of everyday life. Uh, I think that's, you know really what does it for me or I, I do find that when I was thinking about this that as well the images that stick with me the most are probably um, stuff done by performance artists and there was two particular women that jumped out at me where if um, Amanda Coogan is an Irish performance artist but if you want to if you can pull up some of her images Amanda even Coogan? just to yeah they are so striking Emer, yeah. do you think you, uh, you've you evolved from taking pictures to making pictures now? 
My thinking on some level, yes, because um, it's never just to take the picture. Well, a lot of the times it isn't just to take the picture. It's um, it's what I'll do to it afterwards. I, I often may- find like I can't get close enough to something <laughs> to take the picture of it. So no, regardless, I, I'll have to crop into the bit that I want, even on a phone. So, uh, yeah, I always end up doing more to the thing afterwards like it's it's rare that I would just take a picture and it's the picture I have to I have to play with it a bit mm, yeah I know what you mean I think and, and yeah. a lot of your story resonates with me actually I uh, uh the the iPhone coming out really re- really added a new dimension to to my photography and it was looking back on it I mean I wasn't a keen photographer when that came out mm. um I I didn't own a, a proper camera at that point but it certainly um, it, it certainly got me thinking about it, and I, I, I never had the first iPhone. I had the second one. Um, I, I, I can't remember why, but I had the second one, um, and I, I've still got a photo printed and framed um, on on the wall in the house that I took with that back in about two thousand eight, maybe two thousand nine. I don't mm. know exactly when I would have taken it. Um, it's uh, I can tell you what it is. It is a picture of the Odeon Cinema on Shaftesbury Avenue mm. in London. Um, it, which is uh, which got a nice um, decorative facade, the building, and uh, it's a it's a stitched together panorama of about three or four different shots, all taken from the other side of the street. And in those mm. days, the stitching software wasn't great, um, and there weren't many pixels to play with anyway. So it's got stitching artifacts in it, and <laughs> it's highly colorized because you know just just to make some something interesting out of it Mm-mm-mm. um it's it's it, but it really did change the way that i thought about yeah but remember how it difficult did. it used to be to make a panoramic image like <laughs> i had yeah. one that i carried around to every flat that i lived in for years and it was i took it in edinburgh at the top of calton hill and it was about 12 <laughs> photographs that um I tried my best to, you know, I didn't have a tripod. It was handheld. They were taken with the prop camera, but um, I stuck them together in this really kind of, you know, to match the line. But they were sort of all slightly tilted and wonky. And <laughs> they, I, I carried that around and hung it on my wall for yeah. years. There's a, there's a years. lot to see from the top of that hill because you can yeah. see the whole of the city. You can see, you can see Arthur's city. seat. You can see yeah, the first. Yeah. You, there's, amazing, a lot, yeah. there's a lot going on in a photo yeah, from there. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I think, but I think um, imagine also, how easy it would be to do that now. Oh my god! I I think I remember um, my first brush with panoramic photography was actually my dad documenting construction sites that he had some work on to do. So he and mm-hmm. and what what he did is he just took a few photos and then cut them at the right angles and just stuck them together yeah. like yeah. paper photos and yeah, stuck them together sort of like panoramic but yeah. of course with distinct panels uh, that were not really that uh, that rectangular anymore um, so uh. Uh, those were like mosaics that he made and not 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 at all for an artistic reason just for mm. documentary reason and uh, that left a bit of an impression on me yeah. uh, my, my first um, experience with uh, panoramic was when I was in grade school and they called in a photographer uh, to shoot the entire school. No, it was probably high school. And and um, he showed up with a, a kind of a, a it must have been an 8 by 10 uh, but it was on a swivel head and they would shoot three distinct Mm -hmm. photographs and he would uh, print them but there was always one goofball in the class who would after the first photograph was taken run to the edge of the (laughs) opposite side of the portrait of everybody in the school of course and uh, there was always one right and so in all those photographs you see the same person on both sides of the image and i started to notice in these kind of group photographs when i would look at them in various uh, contexts that there was often more often than not some joker (laughs) who would always do that Mm. and then i i was filled with regret (laughs) as not being that joker but (laughs) that defined my personality (laughs) from then on Okay. But also when you think about it, even in terms of like trying to be influenced by anybody at the time, like there was actually we it when the year that I went on that art course, 
uh, about some point during the year, towards the end of the year, the class got a computer that had the oh. internet on it. And it was like, what's this thing? So, <laughs> and it was just all blue links at the time. Like there was no, it was really, it's that long ago, I can't even remember, but it was such a, and everybody was like, oh, we have the internet. And all of a sudden we didn't have to go to the library anymore. You could like, you know, research your essay, but then we had to queue up for like a little slot to use this computer. <laughs> It was crazy. So maybe it was some weird in between time. Like you often wonder, like where I was born totally bridges the gap between, I presume like a lot of us are the same, totally bridges the gap between digital and uh, and kind of analog. Because oh, yes. yeah. then again, no, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I didn't go on a plane until I was 19 years old. <laughs> so. Like, I, I think the world has changed just so dramatically in even that small space of time. Like, if I was to say that to either of my children, they'd just laugh in my face. Like, do you, they have no idea, you know. Emer, do you, do you think the, well, the difference between, and this is a, this is a good one to throw out to the group, mm. But the distinction between a digital photography and analog photography is um, as profound as digital is in the recording business, um, mm. in all manner of, mm -mm. of artistic and scientific processes. Um, I remember when I made my first uh, first digitally cut movie. Um, uh, I was at I, I did a, a guest lecture at, uh, at UCLA Film School. Um, where they invited directors and their editors who had both worked uh, on celluloid mm. on a film, cutting, splicing, etc. Yeah, yeah. And made the transition, and they asked what was the difference. Yeah. And um, there were three of us um, on the in giving this lecture, and we all agreed that. And this this really applies to photography too. Mm. That the the difference not as much in the taking of it mm. in the moment, you know, mm. the, the, of capture, but afterwards, uh, you know, when we were cutting a film, we would have, uh, and I, this will be a kind of elliptical point that I, I want you to talk mm. about too, but that when we took the picture, or when we captured the image, and we or we kind of captured the day's work on film, um, we would have a lot of time to cut it together. And even in working with my editor, they would put together a scene, I would give notes, then I would take a long mm. walk while they reassembled it and just kind of went <laughs> through it, yeah. uh, digested it, came back, made some adjustments, went away, again, really in, in sort of a profound sort of semi dream state of, of, yeah, yeah, of really yeah. focusing when we made the transition to digital the studios uh were very embracing of it but instead of having say 24 weeks or 30 weeks to cut a movie now it was 16 weeks which became yeah, 12 weeks yeah. and so we could do a lot with a lot faster but that moment of separating out and really digesting and thinking about it, all of that went away. So you had a lot more options. You could try any number of things instantly, mm. but the kind of medi meditative quality of, of, of observing one's work, both in yeah, cinema. Yeah, yeah, and I, yeah. I, I feel that with, you know, if I want to experiment and I'm in a dark room, <laughs> mm. You know, I can affect one change and go through yeah. the process uh, in the chemistry, et cetera, et cetera, mm. drawing it, looking at it and going, no, it needs something else. So yeah, how, yeah. Does, how did that affect you um, in, in moving from more traditional uh, film? Well, Whatever. I, I, I suppose I have to say there was a good, there was a big old gap there. Like I didn't um, say between when I would have stopped um, using the dark room to when I, you know, totally embraced the digital. What, there was a good few years there because I kind of, I didn't really do anything but, but while my uh, two kitties were small. So um, 
I suppose I stopped entirely. And then when I when I went back, I did find, um, you know, it, it's more democratic in some ways because uh, your initial outlay is really only in the the equipment, and then after that, um, you don't you don't have to print everything. I know you don't have to print everything anyway, but I mean. Uh, you can't see what you're doing with analog if you don't print it and have a look at it. So um, you can't look at it on a screen in the same way that you can with a digital image. And then, you know, so that I do like about it. But I, I do, I totally hear what you're saying about um, all of a sudden, you, you know, workflow, your your workflow is expected to speed up to match this. But I think the beauty of that, you going off on those long walks was that, you had the chance to ponder, but you, uh, you know, while staying to. in in your focus. But you know, <laughs> yeah. but, you, but you, you also had also to because making these changes was expensive. So you better have you, it you thought to think through about to the yeah, end, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so the waiting, yeah. the waiting has has disappeared mostly, but. Um, but then th this had probably has been replaced from a very thoughtful process to much more of a of a uh, trial and error kind of uh, or instinctive or instinctive, instinctive process. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, th while while I kind of miss that waiting every now and then, um, on the other hand, there's also a bit of an impatient uh, thing inside me that is very happy that I can do <laughs> things quicker now. I, I yeah. kind of like though so the, some of the benefits for me, for that. I mean, I've spoken before about the fact that you're know, one of the reasons photography is my thing is that it helps me materialize the things I see in my head. Mm. Yeah, but where where perhaps I don't have the the multi motor skills or training for for painting or drawing and uh, sculpting and things like that. And mm. um, what I what I do find though I interesting though is sometimes you 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 see you see something and you capture it and I'm not quite sure what it is that I've seen but mm. I know there's something there and it needs to be captured um, and mm -hmm. then these modern tools now you know especially I mean even something as, as thing is sort of shake to randomize on your phone <laughs> you know you, you can you can shake to randomize and shake uh, uh, or, or just hit the shuffle button on your phone in in a lot of photo editors mm. and do you know and then that that can create very very different looks very very different ideas mm -hmm. and then and then often i will find that you know uh, uh, after a whole load of junky stuff i so suddenly hit one i think ah yeah mate that 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 helps me to understand <laughs> what it is that i was intending to capture in the first mm -hmm. place mm -hmm. and then sometimes sometimes that inspires me to to do something else from scratch sometimes mm -hmm. it inspires me to build on whatever that random you know, uh, uh, not it's not an edit at that point is it? if it's random it's certainly not an edit an edit is a deliberate thing <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's uh, i think what what's good about i think what well i don't know what i'm getting from what you're saying is i know exactly what you mean is that sometimes that that um random button it just takes it to in the vicinity of where you want it to be but it's not it's nowhere near right but it you might yeah. get the tone that you want or something and then you can work back from that so it's it's like i suppose layering it layering it up like saving in you know a version and then bring it in again and do something else to it bring it in again do something else to it is that I what you mean i, I think working w with large format um is uh as as mysterious often uh as as it is hitting that random button mm. there there's a um a sense when you're working in large format slow and and compose something upside down and and adjust and mm. swings and tilts and all all the rest of it and you capture it you you have a sense of expectation certainly but it's always for me a surprise to see a contact print of that negative mm. it, it's never it's always better or worse than what my intention was. You never was. think what you're going to expect. I, 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 it's never exactly <laughs> what it is I imagined. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I used to, a, a fabulous uh, DP who we've lost recently um, uh, said to me that, that uh, film uh, is, the finished film is always um, uh, worse or, or better than your original intention. Uh, it's yeah. never exactly the same. And and I found that to be mm. true. 
It's the same with this podcast. <laughs> 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 this one is a fairly good one. So um, I'm very happy about this. So, Imar, thank you so much for sharing all this with us. Yeah, welcome. Um, let's move on to the picks of the week. And everyone has handed one in. Who wants to go first? How about Adrian? I can go first if you like. Yeah. Yes, mine is... Um, uh, well, I was talking earlier actually uh, about um, you know getting a getting a, an iPhone and and having uh, a lot of a lot of fun with it, um, and uh, so my my pick of the week is is an app, a phone app, uh, and it is one that is both part of my history and probably part of my future because I keep coming back to it every few years. It's about twelve years old now. <laughs> Um, it's called Hipstomatic, and many, many people will have known it and tried it and likely thrown it away <laughs> a long time ago. <laughs> no. It's the grandpa but of, of it's all the... It's the original. Uh, it's the, the original, yes. Yeah. It, it, it is. It, it, do you know what? I, 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 still, I, I still can't find any, a, any app that does what Hipstomatic does better. Right? Yeah. Ten, 10 years on, 12 years on, mm. whatever it is. Um, uh, there, there's nothing for <laughs> me that I like found, and, <laughs> and I'll happily, I will happily um, try out new things. But I, I can't find anything that that does the things that it does as well as it does, um, and uh, and I enjoy it. I I come back to it every now and again. I enjoy it. I'm playing with it a lot at the moment, actually. Um, I know they have a, they have a, it's not new anymore, but they have a sort of second generation app out now, which is called Histomatic X. I've uh, been playing with that. Yeah. How, now how I was very, very resistant. I was very resistant. I'm struggling. And I'm I loved, struggling. I loved the older one for ages and I couldn't get away from it. But I found what I started to do <laughs> was cheat and <laughs> I pull ordinary images into that one. And ah. the new one does not allow you to do that. You've got uh, to. You can only um, work on anything that you've taken in the hypostomatic. For, for and for a very, very tiny subscription, actually, you get access to all the gear. All the gear. Oh, okay. So, okay. Um, the gear. I just, you know, and I have <laughs> lots of different the gear, yeah. But it's it's great. It's all in your pocket. It's good, and you can like you got these hull. Ga- and I, I'd love to know. I'd love somebody to tell me how do they really compare, like, um, anybody who's got the you know the original cameras of any of these things. I'd love to know. Can you, can you really spot the difference instantly, or could you could you make a possible fake? Yeah, well, yeah. Probably. To that end, I, I've taken the hipstomatic. Um, uh, what did I use? Not the collodion. Maybe the the sort one of the wet plates. Tintype, maybe. The tintype, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And, yeah. and and, and printed uh, a portrait that I had done um, in tintype on metal. Lovely. Um, and I basically. Uh, She'll act it and then dried it and then uh, cracked it. it. And it, mm. it looked really pretty <laughs> they, damn They good. hold up really well when they're printed. Well, it's not a tintype, but ones. I, I, yeah. I was very curious to see yeah. uh, how... I did some of those with a really old typewriter and I just printed them on paper once and I was really impressed with the, the prints yeah, too. Yeah. So All I right, Jeremiah, know. while you're at it, what is your pick of the week? My pick of the week is, of course, uh, reasons to be paranoid. Um, <laughs> looking at the uh, work of s- one Daniel Wallace, uh-huh. uh, I, I, he his work is is a fusion of of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, uh, real world capture, digital painting, um, in which he has created uh, effective uh, fake humans. Um, they look very convincing, yeah. They they look uh, astonishing, and and each generation of his work gets more and more hyper real. If you really stare down at them, you can see or sense the uncanny valley. But um, uh, his his work is uh, it's it's mind blowingly sophisticated. How, how does he do that exactly? <laughs> well, if I knew, <laughs> I think that's his secret. If I knew, I, you know? by the way. Emer, if I knew, yeah. I'd be doing something like that. Too. Is it like um? Is it like the um kind of facial recognition algorithms where he's just pulling information? Is that it? Do we know? Well, I he, don't know. he gener- know. no, he does. He's uh, 
You can't I don't just really say, oh, know. he makes these with AI, or he makes AI well, and not say how he does his, it. <laughs> according to his website, he yeah. sees, uh, he, he involves uh, building some kind of, of DNA, um, which creates, uh, I'm guessing now, um, he has created a, an algorithm that gen generates the form or expression of a human. Um, and then he kind of applies uh, more AI to it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm literally, and, and by the way, he is, he's a poet. Okay. <laughs> um, I need to know more about that, and I'm going to have to investigate that a bit Yeah, further. on his website, it says that, that he, he's a, a poet, and uh, his, Daniel Wallace is an alter ego. It's a, another oh. name that he ah. uses, and... Um, the plot thickens. You know, he founded a company called Kensho Technologies, whose okay. first investor was Google. Hey, Mar, there's so. your next rabbit hole to go down. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, um, I will. I will elbow my way in right here and uh, okay. share something that I already shared on the Discord, on the TFOP Discord. Um, this is a photo of. Uh, a board, an electronics board, um, and it is a project that is, I think it is the future of photography because um, it's a project that comes from the Happy Shooting community, which is uh, one of my other podcasts in Germany, and uh, they have, uh, they are in the process of building a DIY Lightroom remote control, a hardware remote control. You know, Loop Deck, um, this is the DIY version. So um, I've just received the board. Um, I'll, I'm waiting for the parts to be delivered. I'll be soldering and then um, hooking this up to the computer. And it's going to be uh, open source and everything. And it's a testament to what is possible today in terms of manufacturing because we're not talking about any serious cost here this whole thing will be under twenty dollars wow. easily wow. um okay. so so you you can you can you can develop or you have all the tools at your fingertips for free you can develop these uh electronic circuits you can order the boards from a manufacturer for cheap uh we're talking a few bucks per board and you can get the parts and uh and they are putting together documentation right now. I will. Be, I'll talk about this more on a future episode when when this thing is ready. This is who the designs the boards. Um, the community, the group of mm -hmm. nerds who want to love doing <laughs> that, and uh, they they did, they made this in a bit of a process. So they talked with others. What is the mi the MVP, the minimum viable product? Um, uh, how many buttons do we need? How many rotary switches do we need? Do we need a display? Do we need an LED? So this is the minimum product right now. And then they are already thinking about when this is finished, um, uh, they're already thinking about designing like a high-end version with motor faders and all sorts of weird stuff in it and a display and so on. But this is open source hardware. People can download all the files, order things, put it together and use it. So. Um, that was. This is this is one of the things that right now is blowing me away because it really shows how these things can come together, and how everyone can circumvent the big manufacturers and come up with these kind of things. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. It's very interesting. Yeah, it it looks really. It looks very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, I'll. It, this is a, it. This is in the process of evolving right now and uh, cutting edge. Actually, I do. I do have the board here. Oh, there <laughs> so we go. Look at that. <laughs> Proof. 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 <laughs> Suspended. There it is. Okay. And uh, yeah, uh, just waiting for the next step. So pretty cool. cool. And last but not least, Imar, what is your pick of the week? My pick of the week is lucky people who live anywhere near the uh, Art Gallery of Ontario. There's a Diane Arbus exhibition on there at the moment there that go. was meant to have been on uh, pre-COVID, but now seems to have been extended to November, which is amazing. Right. So, Jeremiah, if you get up that direction, <laughs> Well, I'm you. not traveling, but I have seen, uh, I forget, re not even, I don't even think it's been a year, but I forget that that exhibit uh, that's mm. at the AGO uh, is, is something I've seen that exhibit. Oh, uh, it fabulous. could have been at the Getty um, here which has oh, an amazing I would love photographic. To see it. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, it's very, very strong. Prints are great. I think her mm. daughter Dune uh, printed them. And oh, very good. Yeah. She was a great printer. Excellent. All right. Anyway. It's fabulous. So I guess that brings another episode of the Future Photography to its end. Thank you so much, Imar and everyone, uh, for enlightening us um, thanks for listening to me <laughs> <laughs> of course and it was a uh, pleasure talk shy everyone who's listening uh, of course uh, get in touch we would love to hear from you um, we are on twitter at tfob now and insta at tfob now and of course on our little discord that is growing by the minute people joining we're having discussions we are we're throwing show episode topics around so this is your chance to be uh, instrumental in changing the direction of where we're going here so um changing the future the future of <laughs> changing the future of the future of photography that's mm -hmm. where right. this goes um all the links everything is uh, in the show notes or on your screen if you're watching this on video and of course we have a website thefuturephotography.com which has all the audio episodes and the video and all the shows everything you want <laughs> so <laughs> until uh next week we'll be back in a week from now, until then, everyone, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.